questions is something that even if we only test on the first section of the, of the renal exam of the renal system, we're still going to be covering a lot of the different terms throughout the entire throughout that first chapter. Even like a, a term that they that they talk about like towards the end, we still might use it on the exam. So that's why it's really important that you guys do all your key terms. Uh, let's start off with the A and P of the kidneys. Yeah. You folks have to understand these basic components, all right? The basic anatomical features of the kidneys. Not because you have to know what the cortex does, what the medulla does, or the, re or the renal pyramids do, uh, do such as in um, the, uh, the adrenal system. The adrenal, remember the adrenal glands? Those have specific properties. However, when it comes to the cortex and the renal medulla and all that stuff, for you guys, you just have to know what they are. You have to know that the cortex is the space between the capsule. Well, first of all, this is the capsule. Okay. The space from there to where the renal pyramids are located. Okay. What's this? And this is called the medulla also, right? The, the renal medulla. We know that inside of these structures, you have the nephrons. You have the nephrons going in like that. And they go all the way down. We, we, we discussed the collection sites for the urine. What are they called? The calyx. The calyx, right? That's a calyx. Or the calyces, the plural, right? You guys have to know that. If I ask you guys, um, at the renal at the nephron tubules or the renal tubules, right? When we talk about the, the, where the, the, the this, not the convoluted tubules, but the collecting ducts, where the urine actually dumps out, where does it collect? At the calyx, so that's something you guys have to know. At that point, it enters what we consider the renal pelvis, okay? And the renal pelvis and the arteries and the veins and the nerves and all that enter the kidney through which area? What's it called? The hilus or the hilum. Yeah, that's right. And then so this, the, but that location, that body of where the ureters meet the renal, this is called the renal pelvis, this whole location right here. It's called the renal pelvis. After that, it comes down and it becomes what? The ureter. The ureter. So if I ask you guys, which part of the kidneys transport urine from the kid? Uh, which part of the urinary system, excuse me, transports urine to the bladder? The yeah, it's going to be the ureters, right? Or the ureters, how you want to pronounce it. Yeah, but that's what it's going to be. So the ureters or the ureters bring the urine down, okay, to the bladder, and it brings it not up here, but behind the bladder, and it's got these little orifices right here. And this is where the, the urine starts filling up the bladder, okay? Papa, not too loud, okay? Um, what are the folds inside the bladder called? Rugae, right? Good, good, good. So when it, and then we have one more structure that leads out to the uh, meatus. It's called the it's called the urethra. That's right. So when it comes to the anatomical features, folks, that's what you guys have to know. Okay, please be aware of those things. We were of the renal capsule, the cortex, which is that part right here. Then you have the renal pyramids. Okay, with the medulla. You know the calluses, that's where the urine's collected. You know that this body right here is called the renal pelvis. And the ureters, okay, where, where they meet with the renal pelvis and the blood vessels and the arteries and the veins and, and um, the nerves, they all go in through the kidney to via what? The hilum. Good. That, you guys have to know that, right? You guys really have to know that. And you get the ureters, the ureters transport urine down to the bladder. Okay. And then we have the urinary bladder. What's the purpose of the bladder? It's a temporary storage. Yeah, temporary storage, that's right. Just temporary storage. The urethra is what sends the urine outside the body, okay? Out to the what we call, this is a urethra. Then outside, whether it's a penis or the vagina, you have the, it doesn't matter, you have the meatus. You have the meatus. So that's really important for you guys to understand. Okay, basic, basic elements right there. All right, so we have two kidneys, of course, 
and they're located in the what position? Retroperitoneum. Retroperitoneum. Okay, now let's talk about the real important stuff. Let's talk about the, the nephron. Okay, let's talk about the nephron. Okay, so the nephron is composed of a couple of structures. Oops, I'm trying to get too fancy there. What are you doing? I'm drawing, Papa. Is that cool? Am I doing okay? Am I doing okay? But I love that. It's called a nephron. <laughs> nephron. Okay? Papa, he looks like a dinosaur. It does look like a dinosaur. That's right. That's <laughs> so cute. Okay. So, when we talk about the nephron, you guys have to understand all the following elements that I'm going to be discussing, okay? We have um, the afferent and efferent, okay? I'm just gonna write A and efferent arterioles. This is important for you guys to know. I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna test you on this uh, uh, on next week, but it's important for you guys to know it as if I were gonna test you on it, okay? They both meet to this tightly knitted complex network of, of blood vessels, very small arterioles called, um, what are they called? Glomerulus. glomeruli, that's right. So we have the glomerulus. Okay, so we have the glomerulus or the gl glomeruli. Um, what's the role of the glomerulus? Filtration. 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 Beautiful. So, <coughs> filtration. Via filtration, it's pushing out all the particles. And now, do you guys have that sheet with you, right? Okay. If you guys don't have it with you right now, try to take it out so you guys can refer back to it. When we talk about filtration, okay, at the proximal convoluted tubules. What type of elements are being, oh, actually, before we get to that, after filtration, what elements are being passed on through? Uh, proteins, protein, sugars, sugars, amino acids, amino electrolytes. I mean, specific types of uh, um, um, blood cells are being pushed out as well. All these elements are being pushed on through. But remember, the body still needs that. Right. Okay, our body needs that. So at the proximal convoluted tubule, okay, or PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, what happens? Okay, what's that called? Huh? Yes, the threshold, folks, the threshold. The threshold. I wanted you guys to remember that you're like, yeah. Right. Yeah, I want you guys to remember that because we have the, uh, the, the most amount of particulate or the particles that get reabsorbed back into the body because our body needs electrolytes. Our body needs that pro those proteins. They need all those elements, right? So what's, what, what ends up happening is, is that if the nephron is working adequately and if you have the adequate, amount, the adequate uh, number of, uh, of nephrons and you, your peritubular capillary system is intact, if everything's fine like us right here, then it's going to reabsorb what it needs. Okay, hence you have therapeutic values. That's what we talked about in, um, in GI when we were talking about uh, accessory organs. We were talking about the liver. The liver makes albumin or proteins, right? There's only two, time, two issues really that will decrease the albumin. If you have edema, okay, or if you have nephrotic, uh, um, nephrotic syndrome. And which we'll talk about next week. But that means that there's something going on here. It's not reabsorbing back that albumin, so it's getting rid of it. You're supposed to have the proteins in your body so you can do stuff with it. So yeah, this is called the renal threshold. Okay. The renal threshold, that's important for you guys to know. The renal threshold is defined as a maximum reabsorption that the nephron um, participates in and it's usually found at the proximal convoluted tubule because that's where all the elements are being dumped off. Now, after that, all those elements that are left behind, remember, urine is what percentage water? 95% 95. 95 water. 95 nitrogen. Nitrogenous wastes. I'm just going to write waste. Isn't that the same? What? The 
nitrogen and this waste, right? Yeah, but it also has um, electrolytes as well. It's got some, some salts, let's say, some salts. So yeah, but this is what it is. 95% of it is H2O. So even if you still have a little bit of particles remaining, your body has to reabsorb enough in order for homeostasis to occur, meaning your urine has to stay, the specific gravity has to be this, um, the, norma the normal, the, the osmolality, the urine osmolality has to be normal, which constitutes 95% water, 5% particles, okay? So, as the particles are being passed on, your peritubular capillaries, based on the signals that are received from the different um, systems in your body, whether you have too much or too little, it starts reabsorbing or letting go elements. And then we have the loop of Henle, we have the proximal uh, convoluted tubule, and then we have the collecting duct, right? This is where the urine is produced. Okay, and then we have urine. Now let's talk a little bit about what happens at these. So we talked about the proximal convoluted tubule being where we have the renal threshold, correct? What happens at the loop of Helen? Pardon me? Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. So all I want you guys to know is this: that Lasix works on the loop of Helen. Okay, Lasix works on the loop of Henley, meaning, and without Lasix, the role of the loop of Henley, whether it's the uh, descending or the ascending, it's reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride. Those elements are being reabsorbed. So that's why, so think of it like this. If you have blood vessels here, okay, all around, normally what the body wants to do is it wants to take back some of that, uh, those electrolytes that it still needs, if it needs them. Okay, because remember, you could have been consuming, eating a lot of potatoes that have a lot of potassium. Maybe your body's just going to let it go. But whatever the body knows, the body just knows how to do it. So, but, but just know that at the loop of Henley, those three elements are being reabsorbed, sodium, potassium, and chloride. So your sodium, potassium, and your chloride are being reabsorbed. Now, if you have Lasix introduced into the body, you, take, you give a shot of Lasix, or you, you take like Lasix PO, however it is that you get it, right? It goes into the bloodstream. And when it gets to this level, the Lasix says, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're getting rid of it because wherever you have sodium or the particles, in particular sodium, water goes with it. And that's what you want to do. You want to get rid of the fluids. So that's what Lasix does. That's why Lasix works at the loop of Henley. And the reason why we say Lasix, Lasix is such a powerful diuretic is because when we read some more, right, not in the book, but the packet that I, that I gave you guys, in a day, about 100 mLs are reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? Throughout the day, 100, 180 mLs is reabsorbed. When we talk about the next location and where the most of fluid is reabsorbed is going to be right here. It's usually between 30 and 50. I'm sorry. It's usually about 80 mLs. So when the Lasix acts on this particular part of the body, it can influence up to 80 mLs of, of fluid. So that's why this is pretty significant. Okay, that's why this is very significant. That's why all the other um, diuretics that we use, folks, work on the other parts of the nephron. And as you go down in the nephron, it reabsorbs less and less water. So that's why Lasix is the strongest one. Does that make sense? Okay, you don't have to know that, but just that's just FYI. All right, so that's what Lasix does. It tells it to st um, not to reabsorb anything and it dumps it all out. But what happens at the distal convoluted tubule? Without medication, without anything, what happens there? What does the body want to do? Not secrete, reabsorb sodium. Sodium and? Sodium and chloride, but sodium. So sodium gets reabsorbed here. That's why, guys, let's say you give somebody Lasix, and you give them Lasix, right? And it tells them at this particular point where sodium, potassium, and chloride are supposed to be reabsorbed, it says, uh-uh, so it dumps them out. But the body still sucks back up the sodium. That's why when we talk about what electrolyte imbalance are you going to have with Lasix, that's why it's hypokalemia, not hyponatremia. Because the body reabsorbs the sodium back anyway here, as the, uh, for the therapeutic level at least. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, if we know the body reabsorbs sodium back here, what hormone influences it to re reabsorb even more? ADH. Well, ADH works more right here. Aldosterone. 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 Okay. 
and this is where aldosterone, and this is the thing that I've been using the whole time. If your body normally reabsorbs 30 grains of salt, right, to maintain it normal or whatever, right, aldosterone is going to say, hey, retain even more so we can bring up that blood pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. When we talk about ADH, it works on the uh, convoluted, on the collecting duct. Because if you look at antidiuretic, it's just talking about fluid. And, osm and, um, and where does uh, the water reabsorption occur? It occurs mostly right here. Okay, the last part. So now, what you guys, I know I talked about a lot, guys. I just really want you guys to understand this. But this is what you guys have to know. Renal threshold, proximal convoluted tubule. Lasix works on the loop of Henle. Uh, the distal convoluted tubule is where aldosterone takes its effects. And any type of ADH or osmotic diuretics, meaning diuretics that influence water only, on the, on the collecting ducts. That's what you guys have to know. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Hey, this is a lot, right? Look, I took AMP twice, guys. You know why? Because I never studied. I never studied. I sat all the way in the back. This is why I, I, I try telling you guys, sit in the front. I sat all the way in the back. I was looking at the cute girls, trying to, you know. Okay, that's what I was doing. No, I'm being serious, guys. That's what I was doing. My head wasn't in this. And look how, now I look back and I'm like, oh my God, this is so easy. Why was I so stupid, you know? So don't let this opportunity pass you guys by. Take it serious and invest the time that it takes in order for you guys to understand the basic elements. All right, that's the nephron. Uh, one more thing about the nephron. What produces renin? The yeah, I can't pronounce it sometimes. JGA, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Ah, and erythropoietin is also produced by the kidneys. That's important for you guys to know. So, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll spell both. Juxtaglomerular apparatus, and we have erythropoietin. And that works in the kidneys. Yeah, those are affected. That's what the kidneys produce. Now, erythropoietin is important for you guys to know because erythropoietin stimulates the bone marrow to produce. Less, um, blood, cells. Blood, cells. Yeah. blood cells. So when we talk about what oh, part of the body, because yeah, yeah. Uh, think of a poetin as production, mm -hmm. erythro, red blood red. cells. Yeah. So it's, it's a hormone that's produced by, same thing with renin, renin's a hormone as well. Renin stimulates the RAA mechanism that act on the kidneys, by the way. They act on the kidneys. So when we talk about renin, angiotensin, so it's like the hormone renin is secreted into the body by the kidneys, right? And then it affects angiotensin, the, el the enzymes that are on the, on the blood vessels. And once renin hits it, it turns into angiotensin too, which constrict the blood vessels, hence bringing up blood pressure. When that happens, it stimulates aldosterone to be released by your adrenal glands, by the cortex. And then the aldosterone, when it hits the kidney, it works on the distal convoluted tubule to reabsorb more sodium. Hence, you have all these elements at work to bring up the blood pressure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And remember though, with hormones, they become systemic real quick. Okay, they become systemic real quick. So as soon as a hormone is released, the kidneys know about it already. We know. Okay, the kidneys actually know. Um, the juxtaglomerular apparatus is located right here. Okay, that's where those elements are being produced. When you talk about erythropoietin, this is a hormone that's also produced by the kidneys. Erythropoietin stimulates the, it, it tells the bone marrow, hey, Let's make some more blood, uh, some more blood cells. Because who has a better eyes view of how many cells are going through? The kidneys. The kidneys do. And there's also a relationship with the spleen, and there's another relationship with the liver because all those organs are responsible for filtering out these uh, components. So that's why those. But now, I, again, I spoke about a lot right now. Right? I said a lot right now. What you guys have to know is this word and know that renin is produced from there. Okay. We have to know that erythropoietin is a hormone that produces blood cells in the bone marrow. That's what you guys have to know. Are we clear on that? Yeah, erythropoietin.
Yes, please do. You guys understand all this stuff? You guys should take yeah, a picture of it. This one right there, well, one the right there. Yeah. And then yeah. the that you know. Huh? Right what about it? Brandon is produced there. At the juxta yeah, this is the JGA. Okay. Yeah, the kidneys are tough, right? But this is the hardest part, I think. I think this is the hardest part. It stimulates, it tells the, the bone marrow to produce more blood cells. Okay. Hi. All right. Any questions so far, guys? Now, the kidney has one more function that we that haven't talked about. Oh. Talk about regu uh, fluid uh, regulation, electrolyte regulation, erythropoiesis, which is the action of the erythropoietin, by the way. And then um, <clears throat> we have acid, a pH balance. Yeah, the acid or so. How does that work? What is it? What do the kidneys produce? Alkalinity, the base, the HCO3, the bicarb. It's all the same thing, by the way. Everything that those four things that I just said is the same thing. That's why. That's like not fair, right? Why would they name it so many damn things? I know. So it's also known as the base. It, it produces alkalinity. It's called HCO3. It's bicarbonate. That's that's what it is. Okay. So that's what it produces. So that's how um, the kidneys. The, the kidneys influence a lot of different metabolic processes, guys. And if they're damaged. Papa, Diego, okay? All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the urine composition. 95% water, 5% particles or nitrogenous waste products. There's, a, there's an element, folks, that turns the urine uh, yellow. It's called urochrome. Okay. Now, urine abnormalities, folks. Um, oh, you do have to know the pH of the urine, which I kept saying it's slightly acidic, all right? Um, and the specific gravity of urine, which is 1.003 to 1.030. Oh, and since you guys are here, please know this. If it's 1.003 to 1.030, if I have something like, if I tell you the patient's urine specific gravity, is 1.021. That's not, you guys can't identify that, right? Because I couldn't for the longest time. Yeah, it's just more no, what I mean is this, where the numbers move, because you're like, okay, three. Then it can become, as it goes up to 30, this is higher, right? This is higher. Yeah. Then it goes four, then five, six, seven, then it becomes 10, right? This is how 10 is. 
Okay, so good. So we just look at the two. So you're looking at the two. Two. yeah, this this yeah, this is what's gonna happen. That's in the middle of that. Yeah, so that's what around there. So yeah, right in the middle. Shh, Papa. Diego, not too loud, Papa, please. Oh no, she's cool. Uh, just yell at my kid, that's all. Whatever he does. No, no, no. <laughs> so yeah. Okay guys? So I understand that. Oh shit, this is mine. I can't do PowerPoint without it. I'm glad I put it back. No, I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> I used it. I it. Alright, anyway. So do you guys get this stuff, guys? About the kidney, about the erythropoietin, about JGA, about renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, all that good stuff. It's a lot of stuff, folks, okay? It's a lot, but it's, you guys want to be nurses, so this is, that's why I say that. A lot of people, a lot of students come up to me, but man, say, it's just so hard. If this were easy, everybody would be doing it. Okay? I mean, cleaning poop in itself is hard. You know, the stomach for it, dealing with patients, Dealing with family members, that's, nursing is a tough job, but it's a good job, okay? Anyway, it's a career, it's a career. All right, so let's talk about, let's see. Make sure you guys read the major functions of the kidneys on page 438. Let's talk about normal aging of the urinary system. Let me read what it says, okay? It says, uh, with aging, the kidneys lose part of their normal function capacity. In fact, about seven, at, by 70 years of age, the filtering mechanism is only 50% as efficient as at 40 years. That's a very big decline. Uh, this occurs because of decreased supply of blood, uh, decreased blood supply and loss of nephrons. So if you talk about, if you talk about somebody drinking too much alcohol throughout their lifetime or depending on what their lifestyle is, they're gonna lose more nephrons than other people. So that's how you develop renal failure. Uh, what was that? Oh, normal aging of the urinary system. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm on the second paragraph now under that section. It says, in the aging woman, the bladder loses its tone. The perineal muscles may relax, resulting in stress incontinence. Stress is anytime you sneeze or cough, you dribble a little bit. In the aging man, the prostate gland may become enlarged, leading to constriction of the urethra. Incomplete, uh, incomplete emptying in the bladder in both men and women increases the possibility of UTI. You guys have to know that. Incomplete emptying contributes to UTI. Papa? Okay. There you go. I told you that, Papa. Please, I told you that, Papa. Okay? Good? No? Papa? Good? Mm-hmm. That's a lot, Papa. Okay? All right. Let's move on. Labs. UA. How many, uh, what, what does a UA do? Analysis. We're just looking at the points. Okay, we're looking at the urine. How many mLs do you need? 30. 30. 30. Oh, no, 10. 10 mLs, guys. 10 mLs. 10 mLs, guys. Don't disappoint me. 10 mLs. Okay, 10 mLs. Your, your urine has, is, uh, okay, it says on table 10 2 it describes the normal constituents of urine. That's on page 440. And it tells you what it's supposed to be. So make sure you guys read all that stuff. That's important. And that just ties in with all the things that I've been talking about, by the way. I've touched on every single one of those elements, in it, except for the turbidity. Um, just not in that word. It's just a clearance. Uh, let's see. What does urine look like if there might be a UTI? Cloudy, Cloudy amber, right? Good. Again, what... Um, Sort of specific gravity. We talked about specific gravity. 1.003 to 1.030. Um, BUN, the blood, urea, and nitrogen. Let's look at that on page 440. Um, between, between 10 and 20. What happens if it's elevated, but I only give you the BUN? Dehydration. Dehydration. What do you have to have in order for it to be renal failure? Creatinine. Okay. It says we have blood serum creatinine. And then we have, uh, uh, let me see, it's on the bottom of 440, it says blood serum creatinine. Creatinine is a catabolic product of creatine, which is uh, used in skeletal muscle contraction. Okay, does that make sense, what that is? Okay, good. 
Anyway, we, we need to get rid of it by the, the body. The kidneys have to get rid of it. Um, it says uh, on the on the right side of that page, Papa. Okay, watching me here. Uh, it says the serum creatinine test. Bella. Too loud, I can make him cry just by staring at them all weird. You guys want to see? No. All right, so look, the serum creatinine test, as with the BUN, is used to diagnose impaired kidney function. However, unlike BUN, the creatinine level is affected little by dehydration. You see why BUN increase would be dehydration? Creatinine is actually more specific for renal failure. Malnutrition or hepatic function. The creatinine level is interpreted in conjunction with BUN. The acceptable serum, serum, what is serum? Blood. Uh, in conjunction, uh, excuse me, uh, serum creatinine range is 0 0.5 to 1.1. You have to no memorize that number, guys. On the exam, I'm going to give it to you guys, meaning the question will have it. You're just supposed to know what, what does it mean if it's high. Yes? Um, I, there's a few tests that they pertain to men specific and men specific. Is it just basic? Just I'm not, we're not going to test you on, for hemoglobin, yeah, you probably should know the difference. But for this one, no. Uh, so no 0 0.5 to 1.1 for the serum creatinine. Okay. Yeah, it talks about creatinine clearance. Notice how they're only off by 0.1. Yeah, I was going to say it's just 6 to 1.6. Yeah, so I mean, even if they're... Uh, All right, let's look, at, let's look at creatinine clearance, folks. What type of tests do we use for creatinine clearance? 24 hour, 24 hour urine specimen collection, that's right. 24 hour urine specimen collection. Papa, why don't you share some fries with the, with, what's, your, what's your daughter's name? Delilah. Delilah, that's a nice name. Delilah. It is. <laughs> She's Papa, share some chicken and fries with her, Papa. We gotta break bread. Okay? Thank you. See, I forgive you for Thanksgiving. Here you go. Ah, uh, you guys didn't catch that reference, huh? That's a racist reference. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, creatinine clearance, folks, is a is a 24-hour urine specimen uh, specimen collection. How do we perform a 24-hour urine specimen collection? After the first Okay, so the first void, you dump it out. Okay, then you collect the next one, and then at the end of 24 hours, whatever time that lasts, you collect that urine, and that's it. And you're done. Keep it in the fridge. Yeah, yeah, you keep it cold. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When you guys go to the hospital and you guys see these things on the floor, you'll see this. You'll see like a Foley bag in a in a in a wash basin with ice in it. Mm -hmm. That's why, because you're maintaining the integrity of the urine. And so when they take it to the lab, they dump it in this big old machine. They dump all of it, by the way. Okay, they dump all of it, and it's got this like formula of how much is supposed to be cleared out in a 24-hour period, based on this on the on the on the controls, on the patient, and all these other variables. And that's how we know if it's good or not. 24. So creatinine clearance, folks. So obviously, we're talking about creatinine clearance. Is it serum or urine? Urine. It's urine. Well, for the clearance, it's going to be yeah, yeah, because you're clearing out. Okay, good. Creatinine is generated during muscle contraction and then excreted by glomerular filtration. Levels are directly related to muscle mass and are usually measured for a 24-hour period. You see that? My buddy Alex. I don't know if you guys see him. He's a lot bigger. We weigh the same, but if you see him, he doesn't have like. If he doesn't have gynecomastia, I meaning man boobs, and he, I mean he's buff, he's well built, so his muscle mass is a lot higher. His creatinine for him will be a lot higher than mine, or significantly higher, he's because muscles. he's using more muscles. You see what I'm saying? So that's why they say it's very specific for the patient. Uh, let's see, uh, the patient avoids excessively phys uh, physical activity. Or anyway, um, an elevation of serum levels with a decline in urine levels indicates renal disease. Meaning, if that whole like almost a specific gravity, if Relate in relation to how much urine you have, if the creatinine is too high, then that indicates some type of renal disease. Okay? And it says the urine creatinine should be 87 to 107 mLs per minute. All right. We talked about PSA. PSA is prostate-specific antigen. We talked about that in, uh, in uh, oncology in term two. Okay. Osmolality, again, is how much particle is inside the urine or the blood, depending on what, if it's a serum or a, a urine. Okay. If they're high, that means you have more uh, particles in that urine component than you would in, hey, what's up? 
and uh, than, than normal. Let's see, the kidney, ureter, bladder, radiography, guys, that's a KUB. A KUB, that's what it is. We're looking at the kidneys, at the ureters, and at the bladder, and we're, that's what we're looking at. We're doing, an, we're checking an extra to see if there's any strictures or any type of mass. Uh, IV pilogram, always assess for allergies. Okay, always assess for allergies, shellfish, iodine. What do I mean by shellfish? Lobster, yeah, shrimp, um, shrimp. Anything that has a shell in it, so like clams, oysters, stuff like that. That has Crawl shrimp, crawfish, shrimp, okay. Let me see, let me see, let me see. what else? Retrograde, oh, excuse me? <laughs> Imitation crab, <laughs> All right, look, if we have, if we perform an endoscopic procedure, a, cystos, a cystoscopy, meaning a cyst, guys, S, I'm sorry, C-Y-S-T-O, that's referring to the bladder, by the way, okay? Okay, C-Y-S-T-O, bladder. C-Y-T-O, cell. Cell, yes. Yeah, okay, so don't get confused with these words. C-Y-S-T-O, bladder, C-Y-T-O, cell. Anyway, a cystography, okay? You're looking, you're taking a picture of inside with an endoscopic procedure. What you're doing is you're going inside through the urethra, okay? So uh, my, my buddy right here comes in. Um, I, I put him on the table, I expose him, I grab his member, and I introduce a scope to the meatus. That's what they're doing, dude. Okay? <laughs> they put some an 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 anesthetic the solution and all that stuff. But still, you feel the pressure building up. So you put it inside, you look at the bladder, you take the tube out. What might happen within the first 24 hours? Bleeding. bleeding is common. You just opened up that man's urethra. Okay, and there might be some bleeding. Um, so for the first 24 hours, you want to look out for bleeding, right? For the, after the 24 hours, what, what, what may happen? Infection. However, what happens if you have bleeding after the 24 hours? Too much bleeding. Okay, yeah. Be nice, okay? She is. She's hugging him. Okay. Don't bite her, whatever. But anyway. So no, I'm just kidding. Don't bite her, mama. No, she doesn't bite her. I'm just kidding. The light. Mama. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah. Just kidding, Lai. Give her a hug, Mama. Give her a hug. So tell her, give her a hug. Give her a hug. Yeah? Okay, give her five. Give her five. High five. High five? Okay, just look weird. Okay, just look at, yeah, look at me all serious. She's like, I'm going to get you for putting me on blast in front of everyone. <laughs> when I'm sleeping, she knows how to use my phone. You know what she does? My daughter? She always messes with my nipples. <laughs> like, uh, like, so I'm like, how do you like it? How do you like it? Oh, man, it hurts so much. <laughs> Alright, so know that about IVPs, know that about cystographies, um, endoscopic procedures, we talked about that. Uh, renal angiography, that's just, again, we're using dyes. Know, that, know which ones use dyes, folks, okay? Um, venal, venogram, same thing. Computer tomography, CT scan. Um, it says a dye will not be used if, the, if your kidney function is, anytime your kidney function is inadequate, you're not going to use a dye because your kidneys are the ones that filter out the dye, especially when it goes inside your renal system, right? So uh, let's see, MRIs, no metals, no pacemakers, uh, renal scan, looking for lumps, masses, ultrasound, we know what that is, uh, transrectal ultrasound, okay, that's to look at the, see the prostate gland is enlarged, that's right. Renal biopsy, what position do we put the patient in? Prone. Prone, prone position. That's your <laughs> Superman. So you put him on a prone position. I remember when that when Soldier Boy first came out. I was in VN school, and and that song was so big. And I'm like, what is Superman that? And then I go online and I go, oh, that's <laughs> what it means. No, it's not only a dance. So there's something else behind it. But anyway, my obviously prone position. We're looking out for bleeding. Okay. Okay, you're looking out for bleeding. Mobility is restricted to bathroom privileges for the next 24 hours. Uh, meaning they can only go to the restroom and that's it. Uh, and gradual resumption of activities allowed after 48 to 72 hours. Okay, when you say a percutaneous, folks, percutaneous means you're going through the cutaneous tissue. Okay, that's all it means. Percutaneous biopsy, percutaneous uh, trach, percutaneous uh, G2, okay? Um, that's why you have something called a PEG tube. Okay, percutaneous gastric tube, yeah, anyway. All right, let's go to Euro, Eurodynamic studies, just looking at a bunch of different things inside the kid, inside the uh, 
the, uh, the urine. Let's see, medical consideration. We spoke about diure uh, diuretics already. Uh, we have hydrochlorothiazide, which also depletes potassium, but it does not work on the loop of Henle. It works on the distal conduit too, at least closer to it. That you don't have to know. Just know that it also works on the. It also gets rid of potassium. But remember, we talked about the loop of Henle is where the body normally reabsorbs the sodium, potassium, and the chloride. Okay, this is where it normally does it. So when you get Lasix, it works on this part. So that's why your your body's urinating a lot of that potassium because it's not letting it absorb. However, the hydrochlorothiazides, they work on this one, on this particular area right here. So yeah, it also depletes potassium, but not that much because it's not working where most of it is supposed to be reabsorbed. That's why they just say it's not, that, that's why it doesn't work as effectively. It's simply because it works on a different part of the kidney, of the nephron. That's what they mean by high ceiling. The high ceiling. Good one. Yeah. Um, and let me see, what else? Um, if your patient has history of hypokalemia, what type of a diuretic are you going to give them? Do they have a demon? Oh, spirulose. Spirulose. Potassium sparing or spironolactone. Also known as aldactone. Oh, Folks, know that know that word high ceiling. It's it works. High, it's highly effective. That's what high ceiling loop diuretics are. High ceiling diuretics are highly effective. Papa, don't make too much of a mess. Folks, if I were you guys, I would also look at the medication box. Look, it talks about a spasmolytic. This is a medication that prevents spasm. No uh, flovax, flovoxate. That's an important medication. Which one? I'm sorry. On, on table 10-3, flovoxate, the fourth medication down. Mind you, if I talked about something, know it. Osmotic diuretics, uh, what's that osmotic diuretic that I talked about? Manitol. Manitol, Manitol. Manitol. where does it work? In the proximal? No, this thing, no, the like combinated the, No. No, the, the, the <laughs> You said all of them, man. <laughs> the, the last one. Yeah, the, 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 the collecting yeah. duct. Yeah, the collecting duct. And what, what was Wait, the name of that one again? Manitol, it's on page 444. Oh, never mind. But, Mr. H, right here it says osmotic diuretics act at a proximal conduit to the, to the What does it say? On the osmotic diuretics, on the, behind of, on the first sentence. I know. Yeah, that's why I said proximal. <laughs> Damn, I have to look that up. I know it working on the distal, on the collected tubules, but um, you could be right, I could be wrong. So I have to double check on that one. Yes. Um, but yeah, stop looking clear. Huh? All right. Um, let's see. Medications for UTIs. Any type of antibiotics, guys. We need to culture the. We need to culture the element to see what type of it is, What type of medication it is. Culture and sensitivity. We culture it, and we see what the, what the what the agent is sensitive to. Um, again, how many mLs for a UA? 10 mLs. Please remember that. All right, it's talking about all those. That's cool. Nutritional considerations. Uh, let me see. You just want to keep the patient hydrated, of course. Um, what type of uh, fluid do you give to maintain an acidic environment of the, of the urine? Cranberry juice. I love cranberry juice, guys. I love it. When I work at the hospital at night shift, oh my god, I would go in and I would ravage the fridge and just drink all the cranberry. I don't know about beer. I don't drink beer though. Oh, yeah. You can't taste kind of beer though. All right. All right. Let's look at something real quick, guys. Okay. Acid ash. Acid ash foods. 
and alkaline ash foods. Acid ash foods are considered meat, whole grains, eggs, cheese, cranberries, purines, and plums. These are on um, page 445, I'm sorry. Okay. Box 10 yeah, box 10-2, the top one. Mm -hmm. Know that, guys, because if you're giving, if a patient is at risk for, uh... You're dirty. Papa, I'm too loud. Diego, vea. Diego, I'm too loud, Papa, okay? Um, if you, acid ash foods, meaning they contain acidity. Alkaline ash foods mean they contain the opposite. Okay, alkaline. So look, it talks about on page 445, uh, maintaining adequate urinary drainage. Um, all the elements that we can perform, uh, I've talked about these things. Essentially, you put the patient in, in a position. Uh, if you're going to talk them, uh, go to the restroom, you have the female sit down, you have the male stand up. You do bladder training. Even a bladder training is important. If a patient um, may wow. have nocturia, meaning urination at nighttime, you offer them the pad pan often. That's a very important for you guys to know. Um, if the patient, spit a little bit. If the patient on a, has a Foley catheter and they're about to DC it, you do bladder training. You clamp it for 30 minutes and then you unclamp it. Okay. And depending on what the doctor said, you do it every couple of every every hour or so, or every two hours or so, and. Never forget to unclamp it, folks, because so, of it. It means the, if the doctor did a DC order for a poly, you, you do the blood pressure? Yeah, yeah, it's important for you to do the blood pressure. Okay. Before yeah, you, you, do, you do take it out, but it depends on the patient. If the patient had normal voiding beforehand, then yeah, you do some bladder training. If the patient's been incontinent the whole time, then yeah, you probably don't. Now, what's neurogenic bladder? Yeah, you can't sense. You have spastic and you have flaccid. Spastic meaning it does this. The sphincter does this. So spastic is more likely to be related to. They're uh, always leading, but spastic is more likely to, to contribute to retention of urine. Okay? Flaccid means you're just flaccid and it's coming out all the time, and you're always in pain. Uh, what's a coude catheter? The one that's yeah, the one that's crooked. And that one's what's it for though? The prostate's to prostate to enlarge. That's right. Uh, what's a suprapubic catheter? The one. Uh, it's a surgical procedure. It happens when you don't have an area of meatus or the penis or the vagina. That's right. Um, infection is an important issue. For that. How much uh, urine is supposed to be collected in one hour? I mean, your body is supposed to produce in one, in one hour. 30, 30, at least 30 to 50. Yeah, at least 30 to 50. Good. It's important that you guys also understand um, if the patient does have a catheter and they have high sedimentation, meaning they have like mucus or a little tissue that's found inside because of the atrophy of the bladder, you have to flush it. The doctor will order this, but you have to flush it with what type of solution do you think? Normal saline, isotonic solution, that's right. And when you do your output, remember, you have to count how many, let's say you flush it with 30 mLs, 100 mLs, whatever it was, you subtract that from the total output at the end, because you flush that in. That wasn't a, something that was created by the patient. Does that make sense? Yes. I can never be a nurse again. Never. I would want to cut corners, like, so all this stuff, I'll forget it. I don't want to do this stuff. Um, I know, because you can't eyeball stuff. I know, right? It's like, well, I think he peed. I don't know. I guess it was about half of it. I don't know, right? That's bad. I used to be a bad man. Nobody can see anything. There's a concept that I want to introduce to you guys right now. I changed that too. So look, there's something called residual urine or residual volume. Residual 
Yeah, you did. Somewhere in there. All right, so look, residual volume or residual urine is an important concept that you guys have to understand. A patient comes in, and we want to see if they're actually emptying their bladder out completely to what's appropriate, to what's normal. So the patient comes in, okay, and they micture it. What's micture it? They pee. 15 to 20 minutes later, okay, after, we straight cat them. Now this is the test to see if they're actually emptying out their bladder completely, or at least what's considered normal. Okay, mind you, this ties in with that, okay? 50 to 20 minutes after, that's when you straight catheter, catheterize. The last thing, if they have less than 50 mLs, that's normal. 50 or less, that's normal. Greater than 50 mLs, abnormal, may indicate some type of urine retention, a degree of urine retention. Does that make sense? Yeah. Diamond, Mitchell, Mitchell? Who is that? Should I pick up? Should I pick up? Hello? Hello? Oh, they hung on. Oh, yeah. You know who the body is, right? Yeah. I love it. Anyway, you guys got this? Okay, let's move on. Tip just because it's so different. Because I don't want to make a huge mistake. Mushroom tip working again. What was that? How does that mushroom, mushroom tip work again? The um, it, it actually stays in the bladder. Oh, yeah. Like it helps. Yeah. Something holds it in. Yeah. Something holds it in, but it flexes in when you're pushing it in. So once it, it passes the urethra, it opens up, and now you don't have to pull it back. Uh, okay. So it's, 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 it, it, I, I figured exactly how it works. That depending on how, many, how long it's been in there, then it self collapses. It's easier for it to collapse and it out. Stuff like I, I, I don't know all of them guys, that's the truth. Um, do know the important elements that I talked about. Okay. Um, anytime a patient has a Foley catheter, no matter what catheter, risk for infection. Okay, that's a good nursing diagnosis. Right. Uh, bladder training, we talked about bladder training. Understand that UTIs are the most common nosocomial infections at the hospital. Nosocomial, uh, hospital acquired. Um, urinary retention is when you, uh, that's what this is for. We assess for urinary retention. How do you know somebody's retaining urine? The bladder is um, distended, you palpate. The patient becomes a little bit restless, okay? The blood pressure goes up too sometimes. I had a friend that was at the hospital where she worked at. She was admitted for something, a hysterectomy. And um, she was, her blood pressure was high afterwards. And she, they had given her medication, she was out. Then she came back to it, and she realized that the catheter was kinked down there, and that's why she was retaining urine. She was so pissed. She was a nurse herself, you know? Don't that make you like, sweaty? And yeah, it would make you agitate because you're holding your urine, and it's just distending your bladder, and then it's just it's very sensitive when you touch uh, uh, the superpubic area. It's really bad. Anytime a patient has urinary retention, it, it manifests the signs of UTI minus the burn. Minus the burning, minus the leukocytes inside the urine, okay? But the patient goes frequently if they can't go completely. The urine's sometimes concentrated. Okay. Uh, urinary incontinence means that the patient can't control their, uh, their they, they can't control their urinary voiding. That's what it means. When you're continent, it means you have fully control, full control over it. Anytime you do a, some type of abdominal or pelvic surgical procedure, what can that lead to? Pardon me? Infection. 
try someone else. Please. Okay, what else? It can nick something. Who can it nick in this particular area? Bladder, what else? What? The nerves, guys. Neurogenic bladder. Also, more apple juice, Papa? Okay, give me a minute, okay? Alright. Um, you know what residual urine is now, right? I know, Papa, because you're dirty. Hold on, Papa, okay? Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. There's something called an incontinence uh, kasari on page uh, 449. Um, it says medical management under 449. It says the second paragraph says the incontinence pasari, which is inserted into the vagina to support the bladder, may help manage episodes of stress incontinence. Yeah. Um, What's the second word? Pasari. Yeah, pasari. So what is it? It's a little mesh that they put inside to hold the bladder. Oh, they have a little bit. Yeah, they do. That's right. It's, it comes up on the. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They do. Yes, mama. You had a trans. Right. You can suit. Papa, papa, paciencia, okay? I know, papa. Hold on. Give me a minute. All right. Let's see. Let's move on. Neurogenic bladder, that's what I was talking about. If you guys do uh, pelvic or abdominal incision, surgical incision, the most common, um, aside from bleeding, aside from um, um, infection, we also have, when we talk about neurogenic bladder, some type of neurologic deficit, it usually happens because of a nicking of, of a nerve. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about uh, like uh, hydronephrosis and a bunch of other ailments um, next week. But if you have backing up of urine that's not coming out, that's what ends up happening. The urine goes from, I uh, erased it, but the urine goes from the bladder through the ure or ureters, through, inside the, through the renal pelvis, inside the, uh, the kidneys, and they make everything get swollen. That's hydronephrosis. Hydronephritis is an infection because of that fluid. In, and then we'll get to pyelonephritis, which is the renal pelvis. That's what's, I mean, okay, there's a lot of different things that we'll talk about next week. Um, uh, people who are at risk for UTIs, the elderly, women, you wipe front to back, um, you void after uh, co coitus. So yes. why would you void after sex? After coitus? Because, okay, so you're getting it on, right? Okay, so. Yeah, I used to like coitus. Coitus. Oh, oh, oh you're worried? Oh, the real dog. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm anyway. not worried about me, it's just other people are the ones who tell you. My kids know every bad word that you guys think of. But tell me if they'll say it in front of people. No. Yeah, my daughter does too, she doesn't. Yeah, I'm like, you don't say it in front of people because my wife will say shit all the time. And we're like, all right, just probably just don't say it. Just don't say it, okay? Because he's going to learn it anyway. But they don't know all the bad words. I'm just kidding. Your, your daughter is listening attentively. Look at her. Oh, man. <laughs> That's why I say it. Can you <laughs> <laughs> like, that's it. So listen, after coitus. Um, you have a lot of bacteria okay, that's generated because of the thrusting and all that good stuff. Okay, <laughs> heat harbors bacteria. Okay, for men, again, our urethra is all longer, so the bacteria goes inside the meatus. It takes a while for it to go up. Okay. Men usually get up and they make it. Okay, so it flushes it out. However, women, it's two inches long. The urethra. It's easier for it. So bacteria gets in, it'll crawl up in there real quick and make itself nice and comfortable it's like and proliferate. It doesn't go in that area, so why would you? Okay. It does go in that area. I mean, when you have coitus, that's what you're having yeah. coitus with. No, I'm talking about that when you pee, so that's why it was like. It is, it's right there. Yeah, I know, I didn't it's think like, about that. So yeah, it's like, if this is the canal, yeah. and this is the fat, the, the, the phallus, yeah. the meatus is right there. So you're hitting it there. So, so that's why. You guys like my graphic, right? Yeah. <laughs> Should have done this. Right? All right. Um, again, urinary infrequency, meaning the opposite of frequency. Urinary infrequency can lead to a UTI. Okay, urinary infrequency can lead to a UTI. 
Uh, let's see. Um, what was that? I'm sorry. Never mind. I got it. Okay. Urinary and frequency leads to UTF. Uh, let's see. Um, UTIs, you feel like you gotta go all the time, you don't go completely, it burns. It okay. smells. It smells. You can give somebody like a urinary um, analgesic called pyrinium. Okay. What is pyrinium again, Mr. H? It's uh, antibacterial. I'm sorry, and, uh, and, and, um, like uh, it reduces sensitivity. Oh. Analgesics. Cystitis is just the infection went to the urethra. Cystitis is when the bladder. And interstitial cystitis is in the bladder and the surrounding tissues. Cystitis is just uh, infection in the bladder and in the surrounding tissues. Uh, somebody has a UTI, they have common flank pain, it's called flank pain, usually in this particular area as well. Um, let's see. Urinary obstructions, it could be uh, stones, it could be a bunch of other things. The same manifestations, guys, the patient feel like they have to go, but they can't clear it out. Okay. And that pretty much covers everything, guys. Any questions? No? All right.